This is the Annex, a sociology podcast. I'm Joe Cohen from Queens College in the City University of New York. Today we talk to Adam Slez from the University of Virginia. Adam is the author of The Making of the Populist Movement, State, Market, and Party on the Western Frontier with Oxford University Press. It's a book about the rise of the original political populace in the late 19th century United States, a history that gives us plenty to contemplate when we're thinking about uh, populism in uh, contemporary American politics. So it's a lot to chew on. Populism, U.S. Frontier Society, lessons for today, and maybe some historical methods discussions. Adam Slez, coming up next. You know, we're going to be talking about the Donald Trump administration for years to come. There is no doubt that Trump and his administration, his politics, his social movement will be a mainstay of social science class discussion for years to come. And uh, one concept that is probably going to be heard a lot in those discussions and used to make sense of what happened is the, the concept of populism. We're going to be talking about it. And most of us have a general sense of what populism means, right? It involves some form of pandering to the crowds, some professed fight against the elites or the system, on behalf of, uh, you know, the regular people. And, and this is a narrative that's definitely present in, you know, the discourse around Trumpism and uh, may even be part of what drove him uh, to the successes that he achieved. And today we have a uh, an interesting guest, Adam Slez, who is author of a new book, The Making of the Populist Movement, uh, with Oxford University Press. It's a book about the original populace. I didn't know this. The original, there's like an original American social movement called the populace from whom populism in the American political vocabulary ha has been drawn. And uh, I thought like it'd be a great opportunity to have a discussion about populism uh, maybe make sense of the Trump administration, um, you know, uh, without hyper-focusing on it, pretending like it's the only, uh, you know, event of its type that's ever happened. So it's uh, great to have you. Welcome, Adam. Oh, thanks so much for having me. <laughs> Let, let's get started off with how is populism conventionally understood? I'm thinking about that uh type of rhetoric surrounding people having, you know, popular grievance against the system, uh, you know, that type of understanding. Can you flesh that out for us? How do people conventionally understand the concept? Well, I would, I would sort of separate the grievance version from the rhetoric version in part because, and this is one of the things I try to take up in the book, is that a lot of discussions about populism are about the people who are being mobilized. And there is a risk of confusing Populism is a form of framing that is making claims about the people that are that are being mobilized that may not always match with the truth of who is actually uh, being mobilized on the ground. So we can distinguish between sort of mass versus elite understandings of populism. And when we think about sort of the discursive version of this, um, to varying degrees, there is an emphasis on the things that you know, political elites do and the types of claims they are making. And so there, there is a differentiation there um, between the, the grievances that are sort of actually felt by people, which is sort of like the old school way of explaining this, which is like, um, you know, there was some sort of economic disruption and people who have been left out of the political system uh, that have economic and political grievances. And it's about mobilizing outsiders to bring them into the system. Um, and classically, regardless of whether we think about it as the mass, masses or elites, um, the definition usually boils down in some way to thinking about uh, sort of the vilification of elites and the valorization of masses as a way of doing mobilization. What that means in practice varies tremendously from one place to the next. And that's sort of what's driven this push to get to a more cultural version, because we kept finding that if you treat, imagine that it's essentially anything, it doesn't work. Um, you know, because oftentimes to do this distinction between, you know, good versus bad, elite versus masses, there's also often, which we could think of as sort of being a vertical differentiation between elites and masses, there's often allusions to horizontal distinctions to sort of shore up this us versus them narrative. And so you often see things like um, nationalism, anti-Semitism um, sneaking in there. Um, and this is a point, you know, just 
to give credit where credit's due is, you know, Bart Bonikowski has done a great job of differentiating between populism, you know, authoritarianism uh, and nationalism as being different strains that in many cases are bound up. But where we ran into trouble was to say that those three definitionally were populism. Um, and so you can see elites and populist claims can be directed towards lots of ends. And you see people borrowing all sorts of different stuff to do this. Um, but sort of the, the central feature uh, for a rhetorical or discursive definition is this, again, this vilification of elites, valorization of masses, where there's sort of a moral valence uh, projected onto sort of a vertical understanding or vertical hierarchy. Um, and, and and in some measure, political populism is uh, always in the air, right? Like there's there's always political populists. What what what's more remarkable is 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 when they come to power, right? Yeah. So you know, a couple of things here. One is that um, you know there there is sort of a definitional connection between populism and democracy, right? I mean, democracy as a form of legitimating rule is obviously always going back to some sense of the people. Um, so there is that element uh, connection, but you can, you can sort of evoke notions of democracy without necessarily being opposed to elites. So that's sort of something you want to be clear about there. Um, also the, you know, the corruption claims are not, you know, you don't, and that's sort of one of the things that's interesting to me in, in the book and also thinking about the contemporary moment is who can wield the power of populism. Cause once you start using it, particularly if you're forming a party, cause the weird thing about a party means that you actually have access to the vote which is not always true in historical settings. So who is it who is in a position to mobilize voters, but it's going to somehow get ahead by saying that the game based around parties is corrupt, right? So you have to right. be in a really unique position to somehow blow up the game and become a winner. Um, so that was that in many ways, that's what the story of this book about is like, how do you, how do you get to, what is the narrative or some of the institutional processes that lead to, sort of an arrangement of positions in which there are sort of elites and masses who can find common cause in blowing up a system while using the tools of that system to do yeah. it, namely parties. You know, it was it, it's a good read like that, too, because you can see the parallels uh, between then and now. Maybe the best way to do this is to start with the historical case, and then we'll talk about the contemporary case, because ultimately it's a great question. Like, Populism is there, but what happens when a system is beset by populism? Like, how does populism really become powerful and take over, uh, you know, a, a polity? And it's very interesting. So maybe let's start off. Your book focuses on, like, the Dakotas. Uh, it's like the, uh, the Northwest, the Dakotas, Wyoming, Montana, Minnesota. Tell us what was happening there in the 19th century. What was it like? What was going on? Uh, yeah, so there's, uh, there's a lot going on. And the thing I want to sort of say up front is that, you know, the, a lot of the book is about settlement. And it's really important to be clear up front that it's not settlement into open space. There are people there, and this needs to be understood as a colonial enterprise in which we're using the military to kill and forcibly relocate large numbers, you know, of indigenous people throughout the West. Uh, so I want to like put that up front, um, because it actually becomes like sort of Part of what's happening in that is that we basically have a colonial enterprise in which there are sort of contested land claims. There are also competing world powers in play because, you know, the book, there's parts of the book that go back, you know, you know, 17th century or whatever, where, you know, we're thinking about France, Spain, Britain, all of them are competing for power. All of them are doing different colonial things. Um, but what's happening in the U.S. is that we're basically creating sort of a stratified system of governance. Okay, in which through the forced relocation of indigenous populations, we're creating a reservation system in which you have a whole large number of people who are organized out of the polity. While for the, the sort of the white settlers who are coming in, they are organized into the polity through the creation of territories and states. And so that's sort of the first piece of the story in terms of where populism comes from. The, um, the argument here is that populism emerges in response to the expansion of state and market. Um, and, you know, in some ways, this is um, this is very much like Tilly, right? If you read the Vendée, he's like, oh, this is about urbanization. But by urbanization, I mean the formation of state and market. And like, once I saw him say that, I'm like, oh, yeah, I guess I'm doing urbanization, too. Not really. No one who actually does cities or urbanization would say that. But like in the Tillian sense of state and market, sure, that's what that's what I do. Um, but so this organization of political space, this acquisition of public land and turning it into territories and states, that's sort of thing number one that is happening. Um, 
And the argument in the book is basically that this process of organizing political space is synonymous with organizing local political fields. And so that where you draw these lines matters a ton for you know, how you divide up states and territories matters a ton for the politics that unfold. Um, so that's piece one. But the other, the other thing that's going into this is the building of markets, by which I really mean the expansion of the railroad network. The railroad is the thing that's, that creates a national market in the United States. Um, and this unfolds, you know, a whole bunch of policies are passed during the, the Civil War because you basically don't have Southern opposition. And so we can now you know, create corporations, we do land grants, we do all of these things to build a giant national market. And so what's happening is that in places like the Dakotas, people would say to me, why are you studying South Dakota? Like, this is not the usual place that people, you know, study. But I, you know, in some ways, you could think about it. Uh, you know, I think about some of the work I do a little bit like being an ethnographer, right? You understand a place where it's like, yes, it is a local setting, but you can also understand the convergence of global forces within a local setting. And if you're attentive to what's happening, you understand this. It's not just that this is South Dakota, but this is, um, you know, the expansion, the building of American capitalism. If you look at the railroads that are there, they're all tied to the major, you know, you can basically do a network analysis of who owns all the railroads. You end up with seven main capitalist blocks and they're all there with the exception of one, they're all there in South Dakota. And then you have these people trying to start their own local railroads, like fighting against the force of American capitalism. It's like, it's crazy. Um, and so all of this is, um, yeah. good. Good microcosms for historical forces can can reside anywhere. I yeah, guess. exactly. So there's so yeah. So you basically have this twofold expansion of state and market, and they and they are and they end up butting heads in certain ways in the sense that people start trying to divide space to escape the influence of railroads in certain places, who end up having an important role uh, in politics and basically forming. Um, in a sense, the Western political machines are built around the railroad. Um, right. Yeah. And it, and so the uh, the railroad is being built out. Cities are forming. The uh, 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 American uh, sort of colonial settlers are establishing their their territories. And in the middle of this, the populace arise. Who were they? Why were they rising? And like nominally, what was their cause about? Yeah. So the thing, um, the thing I want to be clear about with American populism is that, so this got labeled if you, you know, um, you know, if you're familiar with uh, Lipset's agrarian socialism, right. He refers to this. Uh, and if I, if I know from the podcast, you are Canadian, am I correct? So yeah. like Lipset's yes. agrarian socialism holds a special place to you, but within the yes. beginning of that book, he is, he does talk about the Amer you know, the, you know, the U S case and the populist movement there, but he describes the, the rise of a farmer's movement pushing for basically leftist politics as exceptional. Right. And the only reason this is exceptional is because we are so occupied with industrial labor. And I don't mean this in a bad way. Like, of course, we should study the, the you know, the unionization and the union movement. Um, and it has important connections to the movement that I study. But overwhelmingly, we tend to think about farmers movements as this weird or exceptional thing. But if you look in history, you watch the expansion of state and market people in the rural periphery respond. You can see this if you look at like John Markoff's work, Tilly you can, on France. You can also look at like Page and Wolf. All of these people, you know, markets and states expand, rural populations respond. And so this was happening in the U.S., not just in the post, post-Civil War period, but throughout the 18th century. Um, this is, you know, Carl Taylor sort of talks about sort of like farmers' movements as long-standing movements emerging in parallel to industrial labor. Um, and so the immediate predecessor for the for the populist movement is going to be the Granger movement, which comes about in the you know, late 1860s or early 1870s, um, which is, you know, push and the sort of two pillars that are there that end up carrying over to the populists are basically money and markets. Um, the money concern is basically, you know, farmer farmers need credit. They need they need avail they need a money. They need available money. It's hard to get, and when you can get it, it's expensive. And so they're lobbying for things like greenbacks, right? So removing the United States from the gold standard. Um, later, when sort of greenback uh, policy falls through, they, they push for the monet free, free silver, right? Which would have made money cheaper to borrow and all of those things that go into you know monetary policy. Um, so there's that part of it. And then there's markets, which um, the interesting thing about this, 
when we talk about markets, you know, we often want to say, you know, do the economist thing and say markets are about supply and demand. But that's not really, that's not, not only is that not how sociologists understood it, that's not how populists or, or grangers understood it, right? It wasn't about supply and demand. And they actually aren't lobbying for controls on, you know, they're saying I'm suffering from a hardship, but they're not asking for more money. What they're asking for is a regulation and a reformation of the relationships or networks around which the market is built. We don't see pushes for things like price supports until we get past, you know, into the 20th century. And so this is like really interesting to me, to, you know, because they're like, oh, like it's a very specific policy solution to the problem. And so again, so they want things like free silver. They want regulation of railroads, grain elevators who sort of partnered with with the railroads, um, but also sort of the most extreme version of the market regulation. Um, plank is going to be the nationalization of transportation infrastructures. They want the government to own and operate railroads. Um, and this is coming in the midst of an ongoing conflict over sort of what the market, what railroads and the market were there for, because the, the Supreme Court acknowledged that there is a public interest here, right? And, and that the markets serve people doing things who are producing for their own livelihood. But they all, the court also refused to push back on railroads rights to private property. And so you have this overwhelming conflict between public interest and private property that remains unresolved. And so it's this period of ambiguity in which you see people like the populists, um, right, which begin as an organization called the Farmers Alliance, um, and they're pushing for economic cooperation. So they're basically doing cooperative buying and purchasing um, to try to Get, you know, to basically do better in the market because they're sort of being pushed out by by monopolists, large buyers and sellers and so on. Uh, so it starts as the Farmers Alliance and then it becomes the People's Party over time, which is this uh, third party movement that actually threatens to destroy the two party system in this sort of period between 1892 and 1896. Right. And so that kind of brings us to the conception of populism, uh, the more social movements oriented conception of populism, where... Whereas we might conventionally understand uh, popular discontent as existing out there in the ether and some uh, visionary politician identifies it and elevates it, you show more a, a, a story of populism occurring because there are agents who create discourses that frame social problems in this elite versus popular narrative. Can you explain that to us? Yeah, and so th this sort of goes back to um, the sense of a ma of conf in a sense conflating the the framing of grievances with what the the grievances actually were. Yeah. Um, it's not a mistake to say that there were farmers who were discontented and that there were issues with um, prices and equity. Most data would show, however, that in terms of real price, things were, in some respects were actually getting better for farmers during this period. But there's a high amount of volatility. Okay, and there, if you read economic history, there's this big debate about trying to get this ex just exactly right. Um, but most people would say in terms of real prices, things are getting better. Um, transportation costs in some ways are getting better. But there is very apparent inequity, like because basically farmers are shut out of the market. They, they sell locally. You know, you produce your grain, you then go sell to a local grain buyer. But the grain buyers are these large companies who are essentially playing an entirely different game. You know, and this gets into like the creation of futures markets, you know, Chicago Board of Trade. And this is an entirely different uh, economy in a sense. And farmers are deeply aware of this and they feel like, well, how am I barely making rent or, you know, paying my mortgage? And these people are getting rich. This doesn't make any sense. And so um, those, those grievances are real. Um, but one of the things that I think people have struggled with in terms of explaining populism um, is that they sort of, particularly in the West, particularly in the West, is that I think that they overlook, they, they imagine that sort of markets imposed on a people who are there sort of doing some sort of subsistence economy, right? As they imagine yeah. they're peasants. But this doesn't, that doesn't make sense. That's not how the West got, got put together, basically, or settled, is that you have a large number of people who are in a sense, both masses and elites who are a party to the process of building states and building markets. Um, and you see these people um, who are basically middling elites. They're trying to move up and they're basically getting stuck and they're not able to do it. And so they find these ways uh, and, and populism becomes a way of mobilizing support for people who have gotten into this stuck position. But the people who are leading are not obviously 
the aggrieved population they're trying to frame, right? And so, um, you know, there's there's kind of like two central characters in the book, if you had to sort of, and of course, Deadwood is a show, right? Deadwood exists. We've already seen uh, the movie version of some of the Dakota politics. But um, in the sort of the second half of the book, the two main characters are basically this guy, Henry Laux, who is the leader of the populace, and Richard Pettigrew, who initially is at the top of the Republican machine, but actually becomes a populist over time. And so if you look at, you know, Laux in particular, you know, he's not, he's actually a pretty bad farmer. Like that's what, you know, I sort of found all these, you know, uh, you know, studies of South Dakota where people went and looked or interviewed people who knew Laux and they're like, eh, he's Wait, who's Laux for people who don't know? Oh, sorry. Laux. Henry Laux is the leader of the populist movement. He becomes, he's the president of the Farmers Alliance in, um, South Dakota, but he also in some ways is like the most decor decorated populist because he ends up being president of both the national, the Northern Alliance and the Southern Alliance. There's it's divided regionally. Um, and so he's sort of this unifying force in some ways because um, he both promotes economic cooperation, but he also eventually he he's kind of pulled into the third party movement. He doesn't want to do it, but he eventually sort of gets there. Um, yeah. And so you have these two people who like, if you were to look at it, you would imagine that, you know, Laux was a struggling farmer, and he's not. He's basically a newspaper editor, right, which was a natural route into politics. And he's basically a reformed newspaper editor who's trying to get ahead. Um, and he gets this movement behind him. And there's this moment as we are making the transition into statehood where he thinks that, like, his people are going to get offices because they have a mm -hmm. lot of control in the state legislature or the territorial legislature. And then they don't get it. And it's at this moment where he's all of a sudden denied this job or his people are denied. He wasn't. He wasn't running that year. Denied the job. He's like, okay, we need to start our own. He finally goes along with the third party plan. Um, yeah. But he's but he's not like a hard scrabble farmer. Um, he's you know entrepreneurial. But the way a lot of people are. When I um, you know, there's just also this chapter in the book where I'm looking at um, really telling the story of settlement within one town in in um, northern South Dakota, where it's basically these people who are coming to steal land and lumber, and they're like. And they, but some of them become, they, they run um, shops, they do various other forms of trade. And it's, it's, it's sort of, again, it's not this peasant farmer story. It's something different than that. Um, but even somebody like Pettigrew, who becomes the boss of the Republican Party, is basically a poor law student who gets a job doing government land surveys. And he does what everyone does. He stakes out a piece of land and then tries to trick people into turning it into a county and then getting rich if it can become the county seat. Like he's doing classic sort of speculation, entrepreneurial, Western uh stuff and but he but he ends up being on top and so he wins in, in a way um but he also goes bankrupt he tries to start his own railroad and then goes like the the right. depression of 1893 comes along well, and he's bust and he's like and then he becomes a populist right he ends up yeah. writing you know as i remember it was like Lenin and trotsky at the end of his life um and so he becomes you know like a legitimate hardcore reformer after having been on the top um but again you have leaders it. like that who end up using populism as a way of securing their own position yeah, it's almost like a cultural product or a shtick, you know, what Jews would call shtick. Like, it's basically like uh, if you're in the business of purveying worldview, then that's a genre that you can purvey. And it's always there and available, but only on occasion, I guess, when the time is right, will it, will it catch. So, like, when does the populism product sell? Like, what was happening in you know, 2016, or what was happening in late 19th century, the late 19th century Dakotas that made the cultural market so prime yep. for this type of rhetoric. Yeah, and I think that's a, I think that's a great way of putting it, both because within the populism literature, this sort of discursive term, but also, you know, if you read social movement literature, people don't necessarily do resource mobilization theory anymore, but I still find some of those early papers like, really generative where they sort of think about movement entrepreneurs trying to generate grievances. And it's not that they're making objective conditions out of thin air, but they are sort of framing uh, issues in a yeah. certain way. And that's very much what's happening um, in the late 19th century. But they built up, again, like a century of, you know, sort of producerist rhetoric that they yeah. level in particular ways. Well, tell them about producerism for, for listeners who haven't read the book. What's producerism? Sure. So the, the way it comes in in the book is to, you know, as I'm basically doing the Jansen thing and saying a populist project is popular mobilization plus popularist rhetoric. And so just to fill in those definitions, the, the popular mobilization part of this is coming through the Farmers Alliance and the People's Party. 
And then the rhetorical part of this is coming from producerism, which is um, sort of a longstanding um, sort of form of discourse that exists within U.S. political economy. Um, the populists are largely taking this from the Knights of Labor. They basically take the Knights of Labor platform and, you know, transpose it for their own purposes. And they are trying to build sort of an alliance with industrial labor. Um, the thing that sets producerism apart from, say, a class-based rhetoric, which is sort of our normal intuition, we're saying, oh, you know, poor workers are mobilizing, it must be class. Um, you know, the, and this is a point that Sarah Babb makes, you know, really well in her, her paper on Knights of Labor, where producerism was sort of a broader rhetoric in the sense that it is imagining a divide between producers and non-producers. And producers are people who put in labor, but within, and non-producers are people who are basically, you know, making money off of money is probably the clearest example. So banks are the clearest non-producers for the populists. But within the producers, they allowed for the possibility that owners could be doing work. They're not imagining, they are not definitely right. imagining a conflict between owners and workers. Uh, and of course, you know, shout out to Eric Olin Wright, that's complicated when we talk about farmers and their contradictory uh, class location. But, you know, the point being is that producerism did evoke a certain notion of class, but not in the way that we necessarily uh, imagine it. Okay. Right. I guess it's a way of, of valorizing the little guy without problematizing private property and sort of other institutions that family farmers, the constituents themselves might have been relying on. That's right. And, and, and I think this is really important for understanding the solutions that populists were proposing at the time, right? Because, and you can actually see this in some of the the regulatory debates that are happening is that they're proposed that the people who are pushing for regulation are pushing for regulation to promote a freer market. They're not actually opposed to markets. What they want is, is equitable markets, by which they mean sort of a, a leveling of the hierarchy that is there and more, more equitable sets of relations. And so they aren't necessarily opposed to the market, even though it does, as the movement goes on, it becomes more radical and you do get a socialist branch coming out of it. Um, you know, pushes to nationalize transportation infrastructure are not sort of necessarily part of a larger uh, sort of socialist project for them. It's one particular solution to, to sort of leveling these relational um, hierarchies. And um, yeah, anyway, so you can see that. And this is, um, oh, I'm blanking on the name of it. Uh, Oh, Charles uh, Postel sort of wrote this this piece or this book on, on the populace that sort of is pushing back on the notion that populists were backwards, right? There's this understanding of them like as if they couldn't come to grips with modernity. And he's like, no, 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 a lot of them, a lot of the policy proposals we can actually understand as being thoroughly modern proposals for creating a fair economy, but that is basically you know, a market yeah. economy, right? So they're not necessarily opposed to markets. Um, and that's sort of where you see um, you can see a distinction between producerism and what we might, as so, you know, sociologists steeped in a particular literature, what we might project on if we were thinking class and socialism. Yeah, it's 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 probably a good lesson not to get too inert with like the rhetoric of the day that people use to describe their opponents. Like often when you hear social conflicts portrayed, it's like some forward-looking, realistic group against some retrograde, you know, anti-progress. And often when you dig a little deeper, you find what's happening is changes occurring and there are parties that are negotiating the face of that change. And the idea that someone is, a, I don't know, a Luddite or whatever is more just sort of a negative characterization that's part of the, the war of words. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, like, so look, I think that taps into at the, at the sort of the close of the book I have, um, you know, by, by the end of writing the book, I was kind of tired and I was like, but I have to write a conclusion. I have to say something. So I was like, okay, like, look, here are the historic, here's the historical legacies and the theoretical lessons. And what you're talking about right there, like really sort of taps into two of the three sort of main theoretical lessons on populism. Um, the first one being is that their populism does not have an essentialist character. Um, the most prominent way in which we see this is to wanting to treat populism as either right or left. Um, and there's a number of ways that we see that this isn't true. Like, let's just start with 2016 and say we had Trump and Bernie. Okay. Both are labeled as populist and you would never confuse the two. Right. So that's like anecdote number one of this is not an essentialist thing. Um, also in looking at um, the 19th century populism is that the policies they're proposing, we would label them as being sort of leftist and progressive. But when you look at the rhetoric, 
there's absolutely no denying that they're relying on nationalism, anti-Semitism, xenophobia, right? So the rhetoric that they're using here is absolutely not progressive. And uh, so much of the struggle and, and a lot of the ways that we have gotten this wrong is insisting that it be one thing or the other, right? And yeah. There's no reason that that has to be the case. It's very interesting because it's very similar to what I remember seeing with Trump as well. You know, it's like four years. I remember before uh, I worked on personal finance and media, I worked on neoliberalism. And I remember there are many sociologists who dreamed of a day where tariffs would come back. You know, that, where there would be subsidies to those who are being harmed by, and in a way, you're getting a lot of what we previously might have thought of as leftist policies through Trump, um, and it doesn't so neatly map onto sort of you know our traditional political spectrum. Oh yeah, I mean this. Yeah, I'm like about to get like way overly excited about this, but that is one of my favorite examples. If you were to say, if you were to go to like 1992 or 94 yeah. or whatever and say, how do you feel about NAFTA? Is this left or right? Well, like, I mean, granted that, you know, Trump basically replaces NAFTA with something else, but like to be anti-NAFTA was clearly left in the sort Liberal. Of, yeah. Oh, yes. And, and like, you know, in tariffs, if you want to think about protectionism, that's a classic hallmark of, you know, import substitution industrialization in Latin America. But it was tariffs, if we go back to the 19th century, our, our right wing policies. That's another thing that that's sort of messing with farmers at the time. And so there isn't, there is no inherent left-right valence to policy. Um, and the other thing I sort of want to come back to is I think you put it really well in terms of the, the difficulties that come when we try to use um, sort of our present day categorizations to talk about things. Because what ends up happening is that our explanations end up saying more about our own personal politics than they do about the stuff on the ground. And like one of the things that's, that's been sort of deeply frustrating, and like I, to be clear, I think the empirical work is very good, but if you go back to 2016 and onward, you see this fight, like is the contemporary round of populism basically is a class for, versus culture, right? And you know, you say, if it's class, this is about the depression from 2008 onward. If it's about culture, this is then about sort of racism and the changing demographic composition of the US. And people have a lot at stake in which one of these things it is, because if we say it's class, like, well, oh, we're sociologists, we understand class as something like, you know, one, it's remediable, but it's also something that we are in many ways sympathetic to. But then if it's culture, then this is something, and some, and some, and sometimes we are, sometimes we are not, but it's, the labeling of whether it's left or right, this gets, this goes back to early debates over populism in the post-war period, right? What happens with the, the earliest uh, theories of populism that are coming out of sociology are tied up with the work on the new, the new American right. Uh, and, you know, I teach this to my social movement students. And as I tell them, you basically had a bunch of sociologists who watched fascism abroad and they watched McCarthyism at home and they were quite rightly freaked out because these are mass movements that have a lot of public support. And so what happens is as they're watching this, they begin to say, oh, McCarthy, you know, mobilized all of these, you know, rural voters. That was crazy. 19th century populism must be proto-fascism. And basically this sorted into, and then, and that sort of then gets replaced by people doing social movement stuff or saying, no, these are people with class grievances who are forming organizations and responding to political opportunities, right? But in those two versions of things, we're seeing people sort of fight this fight about whether we think it's, um, you know, what it's really about. Because if it's culture, it's hard for us to support, right? If, if we treat it as a sort of a psychological phenomenon, and I'm not trying to all cultural explanations with psychological ones, but you see people resorting back to the language of, is it like an uh, yeah. yeah. And so a lot of what happens is that we then start applying these labels as ways of signaling which thing we think is okay and which right. thing we think is not okay. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas what's happening on the ground is so many of these things are, it's both. Like you see people relying on both and it's not easily sorted. And like the I guess one of the big takeaways that I would say from the book is that, you know, if you didn't care about populism, what would you get out of this? Well, I would hope that you would get out of it that one of the sort of ways of doing historical explanation or explanation in general is to think historically and think about the institutional conditions that give rise to certain local conflicts that, you know, sometimes do blow up and sometimes don't. But there's basically, to me, no way of understanding political interests or the meaning of party labels or political claim making independent of these um, sort of local contextualized fights. And that's really what I'm trying to tell the story of is one fight that happened to blow up. Um, but I right. think you can sort of tell that lesson over and over again. Um, and again, like I said, is it, yeah, go ahead. Is it, is it because the, 
the content of these political dialogues or these political rhetorics are emptier in and of themselves than people assume. And the reason you want to look at it on a local level is because that's where political conflicts are most concrete. And it's easiest to see who's making the argument and what they want because ultimately who's making the argument and what they're trying to accomplish is more important than manifestly what they're saying. Is that – I'm kind of gathering that, but maybe I'm off. Uh, no, I mean, so I would say that – so a couple things. One, I would say that, first of all, if we're talking about the U.S. context, politics is profoundly local for a really long time. Um, there's um, – uh, political scientists Coleman and Chibber sort of they wrote this book on uh, basically they're measuring the number of parties that exist over time in different countries and what they talk about here is that the number of parties often depends on a sense do you have you nationalized resource like not have you nationalized oil but basically is there a large federal government that has resources worth fighting over when you don't have that the number of parties tend to be highly localized and what this means in the U.S. is like and this this is not um, distant history is that you had the Democratic Party meaning two different things in the South and the North, right? This is true until 1948 when you have Democrats finally put civil rights on the platform and that puts us on the route to in effect getting to the polarized party system we have where people sort of finally sort things out in a way where party labels sort of mean the same thing. But that wasn't always true. And this was not going to be true until we get um, sort of large national, you know, statist policies. Um, so that would be that would be sort of response one would be to say is that things are historically pretty local uh, for a long time, um, but I would also say that even nationally, um, what happens is sort of do politics. You know, the world's complicated. I sort of think about you know I remember reading Zimmel, uh, doing a sort of paper on Zimmel when I was reading theory as as a graduate student, and you know, and, and I remember sort of like one of his um, sort of epistemological essays where it's like basically the world is too complex to comprehend, so we have to simplify it some way, but the, the political world is too complex to, con like, seriously, if it, the, and part of the thing that happens as we try to understand stuff is we're sitting here saying, well, why doesn't the average voter understand how to sort out all possible policies across infinite domains of complexity? I'm like, that, that's a lot for me, and I do this as a job, right? So, like, we always need to sort things out, and things like party labels become a shorthand for sets of, po you know, basically policy packages that are often projected onto particular types of voters. And this is done through political claim making um, by political elites. Um, and that's sort of one of the starting points of the book is like, where do, where do sort of, where do alignments come from? We like to imagine, and I, I sort of use a, a market analogy here, but think about it from a sort of Harrison White perspective and say, politics is not the meeting of supply and demand. It's much more like a Whiteian production market where you have producers bumping into one another, trying to sort of put things out into the world um, that are that are these sort of simplified representations of policies and people. Um, and people may, may sort of latch onto them, may not. It differs over time in terms of like, we're sort of at a point where it's very, there's, there's not much in between right now between Republicans and Democrats. It's hard to sort of imagine. I grew up in Connecticut at a time there was still sort of a thing like a New England Republican. That's not a thing. That's not, that in-between position is gone. Uh, so we are sort of in this weird place where it is all or nothing, but for a long time that wasn't true, but st people would still put out this sort of simplified. And so I don't think the simplification is um, definitionally true at any one level. I think that is simply how political claim making works because that's what it means to mobilize people in a complex political world. So we're running low on time, and I wanted to spend a little bit of time on historical methods. Uh, so uh, tell me, uh, first, what were the main sources that you built uh, you, you built your history on? Yeah, so um, a couple things. So um, I guess the book's out, so no one can take the book away from me at this point. So I'll give you the, the honest, the honest truth of how how we landed in these places. Um, like I said, I was really interested in how do we treat the railroad as a network, and this led to the question. And this this is something that's always stuck with me when I advise graduate students on how does like a good idea become a dissertation. And I was like, well, the good idea becomes a dissertation when you have something that you can actually observe and write about for a year. Um, and so for me, it was this question of like, well, how do I turn how do I start um, turning this into data? And I, for a long time, I didn't know. And then I was like, well, we have maps. How do I turn maps into data? And um, that was that was sort of really the starting point of making it 
a workable project was to, I went down to the Newberry Library in Chicago and they were very kind and let me take digital photographs of years and years of, of maps. Um, and so I had the maps, but the other thing they told me, I talked to um, one of the folks there who was working on the, um, the, the Atlas of Historical County Boundaries. And they sort of took me to a window and they pointed outside and they see that, and they said, see that street there? And I said, yeah. I'm like, well, that got built in 18 whatever. And once you build these things, they rarely go away. And this was their way of saying, why don't you get like a contemporary railroad map and work backward and delete things? Um, but the um, sort of the way that I ended up with the particular states in part was because I needed a place that I could actually have hope of recreating the network. And it was relatively simple in places like Minnesota, North Dakota, South Dakota, it all was basically a star network. And this is what I meant when I alluded to it being sort of a boring Roger Gould story, because you basically have a center and you have a periphery. Uh, but that was what the farmers were mobilizing against, because this all had to do with the rigging of freight rates, which privileged long distance hauls. So you never got the trains. The trains would stop to pick up crops, but you weren't building other other urban centers. Um, so yeah, wait, you know, I just want to interject. You know what I like about that story is it's, it's a very, very relatable story, too, because when you start in this business, it's easy to become very inert by the methods and you're looking to do the latest, hottest thing, and you're just looking for sort of an empirical object to, you know, use these methods on. And that's really where your mind is. And I feel like as as you age, you come to understand the centrality of the story uh, or sort of the the insight, like the sort of the lay insight that can be gleaned from the story. And uh, I, I like your story in that way. It's sort of, uh, you know, just reminiscent of something everybody goes through. Yeah, you know, it's like you, you live too close to the data for so long. And it's, and it's you know, you're a grad student, you need to finish up. And you're like, how am I going to do this? And you're really, you know, tearing your hair out. And, um, you know, so originally it was like starting with simple states where I could do this by hand. And I ended up like doing it two ways. I did the thing of deleting stuff and working backwards, but I also played connect the dots and worked forward. And then by the time I got done, it turns out an economist had collected all of this and released the data yeah. publicly, <laughs> which was uh, yeah. like so frustrating. At one point I had a paper under review on this. Everyone <laughs> said this can't be new data. And it, it had been under review so long as like, as part of my revision memo, I said, well, it was new when I collect, started collecting it. <laughs> um, you know, and, uh, yeah. and I did end up with some things that, that were not out there in part, um, you know, some of the organizational labels, but the other sort of piece of finding the data that ended up in the book was before I landed on the story of the maps, I ended up finding these public documents that listed where all the grain elevators were. I was like, okay, well, if there's a oh, grain that's elevator, cool. that's where the, cause the grain elevator, like most people don't know, sure. so I put a picture of a grain elevator in the book to be like, okay, this is what a grain elevator is, but it's basically this thing that lifts up all the grain onto and puts it on, on a rail car. And so if there was a, if there was a grain elevator, that was presumably a place where the train stopped to do economic stuff. And so originally I was like, well, maybe I'll start with those. And then I ended up doing the maps oh. instead. And then when I came back around to doing the book, I was like, I have all of this information on who owns these things. And I'm basically like, Oh, let's do the market network thing using, using ownership, you know, and basically end up doing, I did get to do, you know, a block model there. I, I lived out my dream. Um, <laughs> yeah. And so did that there, but yeah, so it was like, so the, the data, um, and I should also say during all of this, um, right up until writing the dissertation, I was convinced that I would never do quantitative sociology. Um, uh -huh. I've explicitly uh, told, you know, look at grad schools, I remember telling someone, I don't want to do quantitative sociology, and then promptly went off to Wisconsin not knowing anything about it, the history of the department. <laughs> and then I was like, no, no, no. And then I was like, well, maybe I'll try regression, and then sort of started doing this. And so I ended yeah. up being in this sort of like weird place where um, I think about the world narratively. Like if you, you've read the book, all of my explanation is very narrative. Um, very narrative, yeah. It's a, it's a historical... It's a piece of historical stuff. Yeah. And so like, so that's yeah. how I think about the world. And, so, and I'm also someone who, like, I spent a lot of time thinking about quantitative methods, but I'm also deeply skeptical about a lot of the things that people do with them. So I'm basically a historian who happened to have learned a bunch of stats, but also embraces it uh, skepti skeptically. Um, and so it's um, an interesting place to be in terms of my own uh, development as a, you know, my own identity and methodological. Uh, can't fight it. You can't yeah, fight yeah, it. Now. Like my fir first and foremost, I identify uh, as a historical sociologist, um, and then will later own up to doing you know quantitative work and yeah. all that. <laughs> Last question for you: mm -hmm. If a young person comes to you and says, "You know, I I'd like to jump into the archives. I'd like to flesh out some distant historical era from the nineteenth, eighteenth century." 
what do I do? What, what are your, you know, what are your words of wisdom to me? What, what would you tell that student? Okay. So two, two things I would say. Um, the first is, um, you know, like, like with anything, you know, start with existing reviews of a literature, right? And, but don't start with the sociological reviews, start with the historians, the history, historians publish reviews just like we do. And they have their own way of talking about literatures and they have their own generations. And so, um, you know, there's, there is sort of a lit review in this book, but I can retell it through the, using the language and labels of historians just as well. So first things first is to read that, figure out what their big secondary sources are, figure out if any of them have been thoroughly discredited, right? I mean, like one of the things I see people write about American populism, they cite Hofstetter, Richard Hofstetter, um, who's sort of this revisionist historian who, um, we often get his arguments wrong, but he basically was one of these people who cited as saying the populists were freaked out by modernity and urban society. And like, that's, that's not really something historians believe anymore. The revisionist critique got wiped out. But if you were to just hop in the middle and say, what's the most cited book, you're going to say something that, you know, basically historians are not going to agree with, or would say, right. you don't really, you don't belong here. So start by reading reviews, go through their secondary sources to figure out which is sort of reasonable and not. Um, but also go through them because they have tons of references to existing citations. So a lot of my work ends up was like digging through to figure out what are the main what are the main newspapers that people are using. There's sort of standard populist newspapers that, that get used in different ways. Um, but also what are they using for primary documents? This could be archives, it could be letters, it could be public documents. Um, so you get a leg up on the most relevant sources by reading the historians. Um, so that would be the thing one. Thing two, and I will own up to being biased here. I am married to a librarian, and so I feel compelled to say, <laughs> librarian. And honestly, this sounds like I'm joking, but um, honestly, these are people who spend more time working with these materials than any of us do. Even yeah. I don't care how long you spend in the archive, I will find you a librarian who spent more time with those materials. They, because the thing is, if you've been to an archive, and I don't know if you've done this or not, but like you go and sometimes you're like, I want to look at this, and they just plop down a cardboard box, and that's it. It's just a cardboard box with stuff in it, and you're like. How am I going to find anything? And it varies. And so you need you need someone with very specific domain expertise to help you figure out like which weird box of stuff do you need, or within that box, how do you find things, or where else do you go? I mean, yeah, we've gotten even since I started working, we have more and more material that's been digitized, and that's been amazing. But there's still huge amounts of incredible stuff that is uncatalogued, and you are not yeah. going to get there if you're sitting on Google and hoping for it to work out. Um, <laughs> so, Read, you know, read the historians, talk to your librarians. That's the sort of the number one thing. Um, and like in the acknowledgments, I thanked every librarian who I bumped into at any point yeah. <laughs> along this. Always journey. a good policy. Yeah. Always a good policy. <laughs> Adam Sleds, thank you very much for talking to us today. Uh, thank you for having me. You've been listening to the Annex of Sociology podcast. Thank you to Adam Slez from the University of Virginia. His book is The Making of the Populist Movement, State, Market, and Party on the Western Frontier. And it's published with Oxford University Press. We're on the web, theannexpodcast.com, on Twitter, at Socianex, and on Facebook, the Annex Sociology Podcast. The Annex is a production of the Queen's Podcast Lab. For more, visit queenspodcastlab.org. Our producer is Hanmei Cho. Music by Lena Orsa. I'm Joe Cohen. Thanks for listening.